Hi, I'm John Maxwell. Um, I'm absolutely honored to be here in this amazing room. You are all bathed in golden light. It looks really cool. Um, we're in Tuscany or California or someplace like that. I'm from Canada. Um, I'm an academic. Uh, all right. All right. I like that. Um, and I teach uh, in a publishing program at Simon Fraser University in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I've been watching the last two books and browsers I watched on my tiny screen, and, uh, and this is much cooler to be here. Um, I'm not here to demo anything. I want to talk about ideas, and I want to talk about um, ways we think about markup and, uh, and writing and editing and things like that, and a little bit of the history of, of, uh, of the, that technology, but how we talk about markup and XML and stuff like that, and, and I think where that's where that's headed and some trends that I'm seeing and I think are echoed here today by what a lot of people are saying. Um, I want to talk about the point, right? The point of structured markup, what we need it to do and its uh, relationship to publishing. Uh, and I mean publishing with a capital P because I care a lot about publishing with a capital P and where that's been and the tradition and the craft of that over a couple of hundred years. Uh, not just because I teach it uh, and my job relies on it, but uh, you know, deep inside as I think a lot of us probably in the room here. Uh, care about that. I want to talk about markup and things like XML. I want to make a distinction up front, and it's a good old distinction that anybody that's ever been paying attention to XML knows about. I'm not talking about XML as a data format or as a you know a interchange format between databases and stuff like that. That works reasonably well. I want to talk about the document side of markup, uh, the publishing side, which is where it came from originally. Um, I want to talk about writing and, and this idea of content creation, which is a brutal piece of the English language. I hate the phrase content creation, but we throw it around a lot. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit more magical and artful than just content creation. But, but that's the side of things I want to talk about as opposed to content management or search and retrieval or any of those kinds of things. So how do we think about markup and where did this come from? And I start at the beginning. In the beginning, we had this thing called SGML, and it goes back to the 80s and it goes back beyond the 80s. It comes out of the advent of electronic photo typesetting in the 70s and it comes from people being worried about vendor lock-in, right? If you bought into the Mergenthaler system, you were doing things one way and if you bought into the CompuGraphic system, you were doing things another way and you were locked in by the way you were preparing content. And that idea of generalized markup that SGML um, came out as an international standard for was to provide a set of interoperable standards for doing documentation and publishing. Interestingly, it was a publishing technology, but it's something that really found favor with Fortune 500 companies and especially the military industrial complex, right? People like Boeing adopted this. Um, people who build airplanes and pharmaceuticals and factories and auto parts and stuff like that. That's where markup really took off. That's where it really went. Um, and all through the 80s and 90s, uh, that was the way that worked. When the web came along, um, and in the late 90s, there was a movement to try to reinvent SGML for the web, and they called that XML, because uh, X is a sexy letter, uh, as opposed to SGML 2.0, which might have been you know, the other way that you could have branded that. Um, the original design goals in 1997 for XML was that it was going to be this cut down, simplified, streamlined version of what SGML had been, had been. lightweight. Agile, I don't know if they used the word agile back in 1997, but lightweight certainly. The kind of thing that you could get onto the web and would become a kind of ubiquitous format for the web. Uh, away from that big iron industrial approach that SGML had been, but it didn't really work out that way. And I think the history of XML over the last decade or so has shown that XML and the world around XML has really inherited the industrial underpinnings. Uh, that SGML came along with, right? It's still, it's Fortune 500 companies. It's the military industrial complex. It's big documentation, that sort of thing. This all makes a nice, straightforward business case. This is the kind of things that people talk about uh, and have been making this basic business case for 20, 30 years. If you go way back to the 80s, they're saying the same kinds of things. You know, content management, content reuse, what, write once, publish many times, output independence, future proofing, all of this kind of stuff about making upfront investments in content uh, that are going to pay off down the road and at fairly large scale. So for a publishing kind of context, do publishers need to adopt XML-first workflows? Uh, well, conventional wisdom says yes. And, 
various people in this room have fought hard to get that idea out there. Um, but what do we mean when we say that? What do we mean when we say publishers need XML-first workflows as we go into the digital era? What, what publishers, exactly? Are we talking about general trade publishers, reference publishers, computer book publishers, poetry publishers? They all have slightly different kinds of needs. And then the other part of that is, what do we mean when we say they need XML? What XML exactly? Because XML isn't a thing. It's a meta standard, right, within which are defined markup languages for particular applications, like building airplanes and pill bottles for the pharmaceutical industry, and maybe books. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things within XML. So when we say publishers need XML, which is, I, I think you've probably heard this claimed in the last five years or so, um, I want to try to problematize that a little bit and say, well, what do we mean when we say that? What are the specifics? How far in are we supposed to go? Because as an industrial set of technologies, XML is a deep enough quagmire to get into uh, that you can easily drown yourself in it. And I think people have definitely done that. Because XML is, because of its heritage, an industrial strength technology with industrial sized costs, right? Um, if you adopt uh, an XML markup, adopt a particular DTD or schema from, you know, from an industrial setting already, be that something as, as common as DocBook, which I know O'Reilly has done a lot of work with, or the, you know, the JATS XML that publishes the, or the scholarly publishers and the article publishing people work with, or TEI, God forbid, or all kinds of other humongous markup. Um, that's a serious investment, and it's a serious investment that uh, comes at maybe not a good time for publishers. Uh, and their, uh, the economic predicament that they're in. Um, not to mention, I mean, there's the cost of tooling up to XML, but there's also the substantial cost that people don't tend to talk about that much of the ongoing editorial work of what I've started to call deliberative tagging. And that's where you have somebody who supposedly knows about semantic structure and richness and things like that actually laboriously going through texts and making sure that the markup is applied properly through it. That's a high-end editorial task. Uh, it costs money, it costs people. Lots of people outsource that to South Asia, which I think is an odd thing to do with editorial, but that seems to be the way to do that, because it's labor and it's expensive. So uh, there's that kind of cost as well. There's big upfront costs, there's big ongoing costs in the industrial XML approach. It's an industrial strength technology because it was designed for expensive, complex problems, right? I mean, the heritage of this kind of thing is Boeing factory, things like that. Is that really where we want to be? The way the business case is set up for XML is often in these kinds of terms, right? You're developing documentation for a project and it's a million dollar investment in documentation and the right technology can save you $200,000 on content reuse. That's a good deal. But how many publishers, especially if we're talking about trade publishers, educational publishers, how many people are actually in that kind of boat where you can straightforwardly look at content reuse as a big economic kind of um, savings to make like that? I think the whole history of XML positions it better for people who are building airplanes and developing pharmaceuticals than it does most of the publishers that I know, at least, because I think with respect to industry, I think publishing is less industrial than it ever has been. And this is San Francisco, so can I say this out loud? Publishing is not an industry anymore, although maybe if we get a Bertelsmann-Pearson merger, that's an industry unto itself. Certainly, I think we could get to the point that publishing is a, in a post-industrial kind of an era. So my case about XML as it has been sort of received from the ages is that it's industrial markup, it's not the way to the future. It's a solution to the wrong set of problems. So is there a role then for structured markup in XML and publishing on any level? And to answer that, I want to go back to first principles on this. And let's go back to what the original idea is for this kind of thing for. If we go back to the 70s, before it was standardized, this idea of generalized markup language, which came out of IBM, and it came out of the Graphic Communications Association. As I say, in response to that first generation of photo typesetting gear where you were going to spend you know, $100,000 on computers and photo typesetters, it was a way of avoiding vendor lock-in. It's pretty straightforward. It's a way of preparing 
your text, preparing your editorial, preparing your formatting in a way that isn't locked into one system or another. That's a good problem. Most of us are still dealing with that one today. Uh, a device independent production format. You could actually switch output devices at some point and not have to redo everything again. Fast forward a decade uh, to SGML when it was adopted as an ISO standard internationally in 1986, which really formalized and I think made more sophisticated the thinking behind generalized markup. Um, the idea that it was descriptive markup, it talked about the content as opposed to how it was going to be output. Um, some standard mechanisms for indirection, a standardized parsing strategy. That was a big deal, right, to have a standardized parsing strategy. That gives you the idea of being able to achieve document validity and test for that, some automated quality assurance. That was a big step forward. The tree-shaped document structure, that's one of the great ideas in the history of mankind. That one's up there with movable type. That goes way back to the mid-80s. Um, people were working on that in Canada, I should say, though, some of the original stuff like that. That tree-shaped document structure is still with us today. It's been slightly buried inside the browser, but we call that the DOM today. That's big stuff. That came out of those original ideas for SGML way back in the day. Fast forward another decade to the advent of XML in 97, and you get this idea of could we streamline this and squish it down into a browser? Could we keep it really nice and simple so that it becomes a ubiquitous exchange format? simple, one single simple architecture for a whole bunch of different problems. As I say, that was supposed to make it simpler than the industrial HTML that preceded it, but it, it didn't really, right? Within a few years of XML's introduction, it had mushroomed out into this humongous set of standards. It was like 15 different standards by 2002, um, and an industry around it. It was supposed to be simple. It isn't simple. None of the basic reasons behind this are obsolete, right? Um, we have maybe some new vocabulary, you know, open source and free software has come along since then, so we talk about open and interoperable in some different ways today than we did back in the 90s. Um, but all of the issues that markup, structured markup was designed for are still with us on a daily basis. And anybody, certainly anybody that's making ebooks is confronting this on a daily basis, right? It's about vendor lock-in, and it's about interoperability, and it's about one simple platform uh, that you could build a, a whole suite of software around and ideas like that. The challenge is to unhook that from the industrial baggage. So getting back to first principles, one of the places where I want to start with that, and various people have already talked about this today, is the world of writing. And I would make the assertion that industrial XML is completely cut off from the world of writers and writing. Most of the sort of concrete infrastructure of XML is about search and retrieval, about enterprise content management, uh, about you know, those kinds of big archival issues. It's not about content creation. XML tools for writing are woefully, I mean, they're almost non-existent. I think maybe we were better off in the late 90s when at least you know, there was FrameMaker out there. It was not a bad tool. Um, today, I look around at what publishers and, and you know, tech people are working with. And the closest thing I see to a ubiquitous writing format in, in XML is, well, on the one hand, Emacs. Uh, on the other hand, something like Oxygen XML. Now, if you look at Oxygen, how many of you have used Oxygen XML? A bunch of people. So if you look at even the one that they've branded the author version of it, and you look at it, it's a code editor, right? It's got all of these panels and things that are giving you status about the document and where you are in the tree and all of that sort of thing. It's not an authoring environment. It's not a writing environment. The truth about writing environments is the same now as it was 10 years ago, as it was 20 years ago, and that is most people write in Word, which is a bitter pill for many of us to think about. Um, but Word's utter ubiquity is so well established. How do you get out from that? So you get this old chestnut in the XML world and the SGML world before that. People have been writing filters to try to turn Word into structured markup for as long as there has been structured markup. Um, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work for some technical reasons, but mostly for sort of soci sociological and cultural reasons, because the way we think about writing in a tool like Word is really, really different than the way we think about structured markup. Um, so that one is a problem that has been unsolved in 20 years of people trying, and I suspect it will never really be solved. Is there a way to have it both ways, that you could actually have an environment that writers feel comfortable in and have structured markup? I know there's a bunch of tool vendors out there that would tell you, yes, we can do that. Um, but I don't think so, right? I think we have to back away from this one. I think in this kind of 
environment going forward with some kind of clarity, there is no Word and there is no XML as we have known it either. So I don't want to get into specific tools. I was nice to see that Adam's got some specific tools that I think are, are kind of in line with some of the things that I want to talk about, but I want to talk about what's in front of us. You all recognize the scene. It's the web, Luke. <laughs> so I want to talk about markup in actual practice, incidental market, effortless markup, the kind of thing that the web was built on. Now, serious markup people have always eschewed HTML and the web by saying it's tag soup and it's garbage and you know all of those things that we've just, well, we, various people have dismissed the internet and the web with all along. But in a move, I think that's not that different than where a lot of people are thinking these days. I want to revisit the idea of the web as a structured markup environment and stuff like HTML as a way of seriously thinking about getting back to those first principles of what what generalized markup was about. I think you can do this without the heavy industry. This is our uh, Canadian Death Star with enough power to destroy an entire planet. Um, I think this is the 21st century and the underpinnings of what structured markup want to do is different. It's not about industrial efficiency anymore. It's not about large-scale content management and content reuse anymore. It's really about what people are, I think, here at Books and Browsers to talk about about interoperability and fluidity on the web. I think that's really what this is about. Because when Berners-Lee invented the web back in 1990 and he adopted a sort of SGML markup language to do it, he wasn't doing that in order to achieve content reuse efficiencies, right? He wasn't doing that for search and retrieval reasons. It was because structured markup in a simple form was a pretty good way to make an interoperable system that supported a whole lot of disparate participants, right? A, plural, a plurality of things on the web, which is the same spirit that the internet was built in. How do we build a set of lightweight protocols that glue together all kinds of stuff that we can't even predict? It's not a top-down approach. It's about the network. So the idea of treating nasty old HTML as if it were real markup, um, and if you sort of squint, you get this vision of a kind of universal API to everything which is kind of, you know, that's a flaky thing to say and it's kind of impossible, but really Google has done fairly well by treating HTML as a universal API to everything. And certainly the people that do content scraping um, think that way too. This is great Tim Bray quote where he was arguing against developing custom XML schemas. Take a minute and consider how many person years and dollars it's taken to shake HTML down to where it generally kind of interoperates and there are good authoring environments. We live in that world now. I'm very encouraged by a whole lot of things that we see. Um, the banner, this brand of HTML5 is getting thrown around all over the place. And while I think it's kind of a euphemism for JavaScript, really, um, I think the idea that we're going to build publishing environments and publishing tools on HTML5 as a universal standard, I think, is the most encouraging thing in markup in a long time. All kinds of things in WordPress. There's a scholarly HTML movement out there to do scholarly journal publishing that way. We worked with a tool at SFU this summer called Anotum that uses WordPress as its basis. Talk about WordPress, you get to Hugh McGuire and Pressbooks, a whole book publishing environment that's based on top of this kind of thing. Lots of people working in Markdown. I have friends in Vancouver in this company called LeanPub where they have a whole publishing workflow that's Markdown and Dropbox. Like that is lightweight markup. I'm very encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by the things that Adam was showing us today, too. ASCII doc, that's not so far out off of Markdown. This is where I want to end, is this disconnect between the publishing and the, and the web mindsets. Because I'm worried. Publishing has, uh, has weathered many technological changes in the past. But the one that we're in right now worries me, because it seems like most of the world is moving in one direction with the web and the publishing industry, the part that I really care about, uh, the editing profession, the design profession, the people who care about the, the holism of that as a set of professions is still mired in that old desktop publishing way of doing things. Markup could have been the bridge to that, but it hasn't been. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm looking now at the rebirth of lightweight markup as a way of rebridging those kinds of things. So uh, if that's uh, in any way clarifying, uh, to anybody or uh, obnoxiously irritating, I would very much like to hear about it. I'm JMAX SFU on Twitter. Thanks very much.